The Durham Report, Evidence of a Silent Coup. Our host, Chris Kuhlman, attempts to simplify the complicated. Coming up next on this edition of The Grid. Stay tuned. The Grid, a digital frontier. I pictured patriots as they moved throughout our country. Do they look like individuals or small business? Were the rallies like church? I keep dreaming of a world I hope to one day see. And then, today, I got in. Hello, fellow Americans. This is Chris Coleman, your host with the Kingdom Patriot Group. Welcome to The Grid, where faith, politics, and commerce intersect. If you're a business owner, you know hiring quality team members is a real challenge. And a bad hire can destroy workplace culture and cost you tens of thousands of dollars to unwind. That's why we use Red Balloon. They specialize in connecting job seekers and employers with aligned values without all of that woke nonsense. Over 15,000 job seekers visit redballoon.work every single week, looking for businesses that won't force them to pledge allegiance to a bunch of liberal policies. Every job seeker on Red Balloon pledges to pursue excellence in their work, create success for themselves and their employer, and avoid bringing personal political agendas into the workplace. At redballoon.work, learn about the packages for entrepreneurs, small businesses, larger enterprise businesses, and even a recruiter service to help you find the right people. Finding the right people can make or break your company's future. Check out redballoon.work today. Welcome to this week's news and review. Reparations, dark money, gender surgery, executive abuse, and the gender mystery solved. These are the subjects of this week's news. So let's get started. California Reparations Panel wants to give state agency veto power over local real estate decisions. Now, when you read this article and dive into it, what this reparations panel is actually doing, it's saying that real estate transactions may not occur at the local level if we haven't deemed that they are promoting desegregation and not furthering what they call segregatory, I, I would say segregatory type of practices. But it means all the hands are in this particular panel. They have the veto power. They have the yay or the nay. They go or no go decision making power. It's completely unlegislated. Unbelievable. Speaking of unbelievable, recent emails that have been uncovered show that the Biden administration coordinated with tons of liberal dark money to literally transform our food system. This particular individual that they were colluding with is Eric Kessler, the founder and principal of Arabella Advisors Consulting Firm. They tend to oversee just an unbelievable amount, a behemoth amount of dark money, meaning that it's free from view and accountability. People don't really know that it's occurring. And this particular individual has been advising on key agricultural policy issues. And in fact, on some internal communication with the USDA, they determined that Kessler was involved in initiatives to absolutely transform the U.S. food system and to crack down on the meat industry for high prices. And Kessler was the only individual on these email chains who was not affiliated or employed in some way by the USDA. And these emails re reveal that Eric had direct access to Biden cabinet officials and that he played an intimate role in this particular agenda. Once again, rules for thee, but not for me. Okay, this next story, I, I, I don't know how many times I have to repeat this, but I'm going to do it every time this comes up. And that is this idea of the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. That is the charge to healthcare providers. Well, in Massachusetts, they're taking this whole thing a step further. Not only are they saying that physicians and providers should provide gender-affirming care, but now they're going after the parents. So it's also an example of lawlessness as well as not adhering to the Hippocratic Oath. So what they're going to do is they're going to target parents who deny their kids gender-affirming care, and they're going to say this is either a misdemeanor or a felony, and either take the kids away or fine them or potentially even prison. Folks, is this crazy? I mean, I can't even believe I'm hearing this. But on one hand, it's also what to expect, because in the last days we know they will call what is evil good and what is good evil. Now, when we opened today's news, I made mention of executive abuse. And I know with this particular administration, there are tons of examples. But this one is a new one, and this is with the FBI. And that is the FBI apparently 
used warrantless search powers improperly in 2021. And what that means is, is there are certain situations where the FBI could issue a search on someone or a corporation without having a warrant. I don't know what those circumstances are, but it it does happen. It is allowed, apparently. But there are strict parameters around that. Well, the FBI improperly used this ability, improperly used these warrantless searches. Otherwise, you're supposed to get a warrant. But it's not that they used it that's shocking. It's the number of times they found out in looking at their own systems that in 2021, they improperly used these search powers 278. No, not 278 times. 278,000 times in 2021. Can you even wrap your mind around that number? Where you're talking, that means on average 761 times per day, the FBI was using search powers that they were not entitled to have. Ladies and gentlemen, I call that executive abuse. Now, for our last story, this one is going to be a shocker. I want I want you to meet someone who has unlocked the science of gender. Her name is Nettie Stevens. This is a big deal. This just broke. The story just broke. She actually decoded the science between the two genders. Oh, my goodness. In fact, not only being a cytogeneticist, she was also a researcher at Bryn Mawr College just outside of Philadelphia. She discovered, folks, that sex is determined by hereditary traits passing through chromosomes. I know, shocker, right? Females are born with a pair of double X chromosomes, inheriting the X from both the mother and the father. Males are born with XY chromosomes. The X is from the mother and the Y is from the father. Okay, I know this is shocking. This should put this debate to rest. You may not have heard this story. I read it, but you may not have heard about it. And you may not even know Nettie Stevens. And why? Because she discovered this in 1905. You got that right. Here we are more than 100 years later, and we're having a debate that was easily, scientifically, completely put to rest in 1905. But I digress. And of course, the biggest news of this past week is the Durham Report. Well, that happens to be coming up next as our main podcast topic. For this week's news and review, that's a wrap. Okay, if you're a freedom-loving American, the most important story of this past week, the most shocking story of this past week, is John Durham's report in which he finalized and submitted to Merrick Garland, our current attorney general. Now, unfortunately, he is a horrible attorney general. But then again, Democratic presidents have nominated Eric Holder, Loretta Lynch, and Merrick Garland as of late. So these are all complete political hacks. So I'm not sure we'd be surprised that we have another bad attorney general, but I digress. We're really talking about John Durham. So for years, literally the last seven years, you have heard tons about this story. But today, here on The Grid, we are going to attempt to make the complex simple. And over the next few minutes together, we're going to make this easy to understand so that you have a clear picture of what happened and you can make your own decision if you think there was negligence, incompetence, or something far more nefarious at hand. Much of this information that we're going to discuss today is actually going to come directly from the Durham Report. We are going to quote him many times. And I also want to point to, even though this report is over 300 pages, in particular, the executive summary is about 12 pages or so. And it gives a great view into what he looked at and what he found. It gives incredible insight. I would encourage you to Google that and you can get the report and take a look. So as we think of timelines, one of the most important things that Bill Barr did when he was the attorney general under Trump was to appoint John Durham as special counsel to investigate the origins of the Trump-Russia collusion hoax. And it's easy to see that Barr was no fan of Trump or his leadership. But when you think about Barr, he does seem to have a high regard for the law. And by appointing Durham, he assured the country that the process would continue apart from the elections and political processes that were going to follow. And without that single decision that Barr made, much of the information that is now a fact would never have seen the light of day. So let's do a back to the future type of story. Let's head back to 2016. And yes, folks, you heard that correctly, seven years ago. So in the beginning, I want to take you back to 
June of 2016. And according to Real Clear Politics, the polls on the Clinton versus Trump presidential election, as they, you know, do these polls as you're getting closer to the election, they were starting to tighten considerably. And in fact, on June 16th, Clinton was up by almost six points, 5.8 points. But then those polls started tightening consistently, and they were trending all the way up until July 27th. Trump actually now held a 1.1 lead. So you're talking about a seven-point swing in just over a month. That bat drop. Those polls are likely responsible for the entire Russia collusion hoax that we're discussing today. At least they're responsible indirectly. So let me explain. You're Hillary Rodham Clinton. You are the heir apparent to the presidency. You have built your entire career for this moment. From attorney to first lady to senator to secretary of state to now Democratic nominee for the president of the United States. And you are realizing that you are in the fight of your life with someone in your view who is bombastic, arrogant, and has no right, no claim to what is rightfully yours. And that is the throne of the presidency. So what do you do? You do what you always have done. You lie, you cheat, and you steal. And that's where the story really begins. On July 26, 2016, U.S. intelligence agencies obtained insight from Russian intelligence analysis alleging that the U.S. presidential candidate Hillary Clinton had approved, say that again, had approved a campaign plan to stir up a scandal against Donald Trump by tying him to Putin and Russia's hacking of the Democratic National Committee. The report, the Durham report, refers to this as the Clinton Plan Intelligence. So in layman's terms, U.S. intelligence had a tip that Hillary was going to play serious shenanigans with the truth in order to smear Trump. This tip was treated seriously enough that the director of the CIA, John Brennan, immediately briefed President Obama two days later on July 28th, and one day after that, to FBI Director James Comey. All this happened at the end of July. Then August the 3rd, five days after Hillary approved the smear campaign, Brennan met with the president, vice president, and other senior administration officials, including but not limited to the attorney general and the FBI director in the White House Situation Room to discuss Russian election interference efforts. Brennan briefed on relevant intelligence known to date on the Russian election interference, including vilifying Donald Trump by stirring up the scandal claiming interference by Russian security services. So, folks, what does this mean? Well, We've all known for the last seven years that Clinton was smearing Trump. No one debated that. We wanted to know if it was true about Trump. Yeah, that that is true. We wanted to know. But we all knew it was a smear campaign, or at least it was being utilized as such. But what is startling here, what is shocking, is that from the very beginning, intelligence sources intercepted communications in which they knew Hillary was going to do this very thing. And this is important because anything, and I mean anything tied back to the Clinton campaign, should have been met with serious doubt to its veracity and accuracy. So let's continue with the timeline. July 19th, 22nd, 25th, 26th, all prior to us understanding through a tip that Hillary had approved this, Fusion GPS, now Fusion GPS is the opposition research firm that the Hillary campaign engaged to find dirt on Trump. On those dates, the 19th, 22nd, 25th, and 26th of July, they started having email dialogue with Quartz, Slate, Reuters, New York Magazine, and the Wall Street Journal to start the public rollout of the Trump collusion hoax. Folks, this is before it ever made it into the hands of government officials. So just prior to this timeline, Fusion GPS had hired Christopher Steele to gather that dirt on Trump. He was their agent, if you so to speak. And the very first FBI agent, who handled this interview with Steele, knew that this was politically motivated and that it had serious political origins and that it was ultimately paid and directed for by the Democratic Party. He actually interviewed Steele, this FBI agent, he actually interviewed Steele on July the 5th, but the Steele dossier documents were never turned over by the FBI to the Crossfire Hurricane Task Force until September 19th. So just Put that at what? Why did the government hold on to those documents for so long? Well, the timeline continues. In September of 2016, portions of the Steele dossier were used in the initial FISA application. Folks, this is the FISA court. This is called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, 
And it's a court that we're talking about. It's an unconstitutional secret court that allows the spying on American citizens if there's some sort of connection to a foreign national security. Well, the information on this FISA application specifically to target Carter Page, who was Trump's campaign associate, was never verified. Not one piece of supposed evidence was verified by an independent source. And worse, part of the reasoning for spying on Carter Page was because he met with Russian folks on a particular business trip. Okay, maybe that raises red flags. However, the FBI contacted the CIA and asked, hey, is Carter Page your asset? Is he a source that you're using to gather information? And the CIA said, yes, absolutely. He is our informant. When the attorney representing Crossfire Hurricane submitted the original application to the FISA court, he altered and docked the information to say that Carter Page is not a source or asset of any government agency. Completely reversed and lied about that information. And the reasoning is the FISA court likely would have denied his request to wiretap Carter Page. But this was to show that there was no good reason that Carter Page would be meeting with Russian citizens unless it was nefarious. By the way, that attorney was later indicted by John Durham and ultimately convicted of this felony. Important information. Folks, did you get what I just said? This entire investigation would never have started if not for the complete falsification of a FISA warrant. That keeps getting lost in this conversation. But even if Trump had done these things, even if he had done illegal activity, which we know is not true because this report completely exonerates that, but even if he did, even if he was guilty, likely as a defense, Trump would have said, you had an illegal warrant and everything you collected is inadmissible in court. And you know what? He likely could win that defense. The unethical behavior, this unspeakable illegal act by this attorney, apparently the hubris knows no bounds. So those are the kind of the primary timelines. All this other stuff is just the time of doing the investigation, of interviewing, of gathering information. But those are the timelines that you need to understand not only the origins, but how fast the Crossfire Hurricane Task Force moved. So I want to also read to you, now this, a lot of this comes directly from Durham's executive summary. These are questions that Durham said he was tasked with answering in his investigation. So I'm going to read through these as well as the answers and what he found. So his first question. Was there adequate predication for the FBI to open the Crossfire Hurricane investigation from its inception on July 31st, 2016 as a full counterintelligence and foreign agents registration act investigation given the general guidance by the Attorney General and FBI policies for domestic operations? Unequivocally, the answer is no. This was a Hillary Clinton hit piece through and through. The CIA knew it. The FBI knew it. The Obama administration knew it. And yet they steamrolled with amazing speed and intent. So the the question number one is, no, there was absolutely no reason to do this investigation. Okay, question number two. Was the opening of Crossfire Hurricane as a full investigation consistent with how the FBI handled other intelligence it had received prior to that date concerning attempts by foreign interests to influence the Clinton and other campaigns? So Durham lays this out in astonishing findings. The investigation into Clinton's email scandal, if you remember she had that secret email server in her basement. Everybody knew she was, it was illegal. She had classified information. She lied about it. It doesn't matter. It took a completely different tone from the FBI. It had no sense of urgency. It had no sense of speed. The intent at which how they approached it was completely different than Crossfire Hurricane. The FBI went very slow with Clinton and actually informed her all along the way and briefed her on the investigation. It took months and months of debate. In fact, the FBI actually shut down four other related investigations of Hillary Clinton under the premise they didn't want to impact the presidential election of someone who might actually become president. Yet with Trump, there was no briefing, no notification, and most importantly, no attempt at all to corroborate a single shred of evidence to actually determine if this was just more than a political witch hunt. Even worse, Peter Strzok of the FBI, the lead investigator and assistant deputy director of Crossfire Hurricane, openly expressed his disdain and hostile feelings toward Trump and how he must be stopped at any cost. In Durham's own words, the matter was opened as a full investigation without ever having spoken to the persons who provided the information. So to answer the question, was the investigation into Trump treated similarly to others? Absolutely not. Not even close. Question number three, when we return. I'm so glad you asked how you can help for free. Subscribe or follow The Grid and set your phone out for automatic downloads 
You'll have immediate access to each new episode, and you'll help us appear at the top of your podcast platform search list. This makes the grid easier for everyone to find. From all of us at the Kingdom Patriot Group, thank you for joining us in the fight for faith and freedom by subscribing to the grid. So question number three, did the FBI properly consider other highly significant intelligence it received at virtually the same time of what it used to predicate Crossfire Hurricane, but which related to the Trump campaign, not just the Trump campaign, but rather to the Clinton campaign, especially in the fact that she wanted to vilify Donald Trump by stirring up scandal claiming interference by Russian security services? The answer is absolutely not. There was no independent intelligence in any U.S. intelligence agency that could corroborate a single piece of Christopher Steele's claims in the Steele dossier. Not a single piece of evidence. It didn't exist. Nada. All intelligence agencies had plenty about Hillary and some of her shenanigans, but nothing about Trump. Don't think any information existed? The FBI knew that it didn't exist. It's so much to so that in the Durham report, it states that our investigation determined that Crossfire Hurricane investigators did not and could not corroborate any of the substantive allegations contained in the Steele reporting, nor was Steele, this is supposedly the author of all this, nor was Steele able to produce corroboration for any of the reported allegations, even after the FBI offered him $1 million to do so. Did you hear that, folks? I'll get back to that in a second. Further, when interviewed by the FBI in January 2017, Danchenko also was unable to corroborate any of the substantive allegations in the reports. Rather, Danchenko characterized the information he provided to Steele as rumor and speculation and the product of casual conversation. Folks, did you get what I just said? The FBI said, Steele, we want to corroborate this. Give us something. We will give you a million dollars if you can just back up your claims. And Steele could not do it. That was in January of 2017, yet the investigation continued. Okay, so Durham asked question number four. Was there evidence that the actions of any FBI personnel or third parties relating to the Crossfire Hurricane investigation violated any federal criminal statutes, including the prohibition against making false statements to federal officials? And he kind of goes on, well, here's where I disagree with Durham. People should go to jail for this. And what is my reasoning? It's simple. If a private U.S. citizen acted in the way that Peter Strzok or James Covey or Lisa Page did, would they go to jail? I think obviously they would. So why is this standard any different for a government official? This is an example of government targeting private citizens and using the power, the ultimate legal and enforcement arm of the government for personal and political purposes. Okay, the last question that Durham asked, was there evidence that the actions of the FBI or department personnel in providing false or complete information to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court violate any federal criminal statutes? Well, as stated earlier, the answer is absolutely yes. An attorney falsified the original FISA application, and he was prosecuted and convicted. We could do an entire podcast on the constitutionality or lack thereof of the FISA court, but that's probably for a different podcast. At the end of the day, you will hear things like Christopher Steele and Fusion GPS and Igor Danchenko and Charles Dolan and even Hillary Clinton. None of this is surprising. Lots of names. But by my own account, completely irrelevant. In lay terms, you have a political presidential candidate, Hillary Clinton, in a mess of legal trouble because she's a liar, a thief, and by all accounts, an evil person. Who wouldn't expect her to dig up dirt on a political opponent that she sees as a threat? But more importantly, to completely distract from her own troubles. Of course that would happen. Why is that surprising? None of this is unexpected. The real bombshell, the real shocker, is that the FBI, CIA, and Obama administration knew this. They knew the source of this. These folks took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution. And it's clear they completely bastardized that oath. They violated policies. They allowed their disdain and personal feelings to impact their judgment. And they openly subverted the election process and, in essence, attempted to implement a silent coup. In conclusion, let's read the remarks from John Durham as he closed his executive summary. And I quote, Based on the review of Crossfire Hurricane and related intelligence activities, We conclude that the department and the FBI failed to uphold their important mission of strict fidelity to the law in connection with certain events and activities described in this report. 
As noted, former FBI attorney Kevin Kleinsmith committed a criminal offense by fabricating language in an email that was material to the FBI obtaining a FISA surveillance order. In other instances, FBI personnel working on that same FISA application displayed at best a cavalier attitude towards accuracy and completeness. FBI personnel also repeatedly disregarded important requirements when they continued to seek renewals of the FISA surveillance, while acknowledging both then and in hindsight that they did not genuinely believe there was probable cause to believe that the target was knowingly engaged in clandestine intelligence. Our investigation also revealed that senior FBI personnel displayed a serious lack of analytical rigor towards the information that they had received, especially information received from politically affiliated persons and entities. This information in part triggered and sustained the Crossfire Hurricane and contributed to the subsequent need for Special Counsel Mueller's investigation. In particular, there was significant reliance on investigative leads provided or funded directly or indirectly by Trump's political opponents. The department did not adequately examine or question these materials and the motivations of those providing them, even when at about the same time the director of the FBI and others learned of significant and potentially contrary intelligence. End quote. Okay, in other words, hey FBI, you suck. Your policies are good, but your people are horrible, and you lack all intelligence and integrity in this process. And Trump was vilified in the media for making claims about the deep state. Folks, this is the quintessential definition of the deep state. Hopefully you now have a better understanding of this investigation, its origins, and even its conclusions. And why? Because you have listened to The Grid, a podcast production of the Kingdom Patriot Group. Until next time. Thanks for joining us for today's edition of The Grid. And a special thanks to our sponsor, Red Balloon and all the pushback they're doing against wokeness in the workplace. Go to redballoon.work today to learn how like-minded job seekers and employers can find each other. Be sure to visit our website at kingdompatriot.us to join the movement of faith and freedom. That's kingdompatriot.us. Join today so that together we can make a difference. Your membership is appreciated, your input is valued, and your voice is needed. I'm Chris Coleman. And I am a Kingdom Patriot.